Turn your Bibles with me to the book of Acts this morning. Acts chapter 9. If things work like they should, you'd do your Bible, just lay it open, and it would fall open to Acts chapter 9 because that's kind of a, 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 a hurdle. It's a, a high spot, uh, if you will. It's a transition point um, in, uh, in the church, in the New Testament church, as uh, we move from a church that has, uh, that uh, up until this point, uh, the Apostle Peter uh, had uh, largely uh, been in charge and been the leader. Um, and moving from this point forward, we're going to begin to see uh, Paul uh, step up. And the passage we're looking at uh, this morning um, is the passage where uh, Saul uh, gets his call. Uh, where Saul is uh, called out, and uh, it's, um, it's an interesting story. Most of us uh, in the church this morning know a little bit about, uh, about Saul. We know that um, Saul was a, um, I don't know all the adjectives we would use to describe Saul. He was a wicked, mean, nasty man, uh, based on our description of him. But uh, in many ways, um, to, to the people at that time, uh, Saul to some extent would have been a hero. Uh, Saul, while we know, as the Bible tells us in this chapter, was uh, breathing hatred, was breathing uh, persecution uh, towards the Christian, uh, he, was in, he was basically being a, a good Jew. Uh, he was defending uh, Judaism. He saw Christianity as uh, a threat. He, he saw these new people who were uh, this new religion that was uh, blossoming and uh, and coming out as a uh, as a direct insult uh, to, uh, to to everything he had known and loved, uh, everything he had been taught his entire life. Uh, imagine uh, I, the best way uh, that uh, really for us, I think, to kind of uh, get a handle on uh, on Saul's position uh, would be as uh, for us, all we've ever known uh, is the story of Christianity. All we've ever known is the story of Christ, His death, burial, resurrection. Uh, that's what we know. That's what we sing about. Uh, that's what we teach about. That's, uh, that's all we've ever heard. That's, uh, you know, Grandma talked about it. Great Grandma talked about it. Uh, that's um, what we know. Uh, and uh, the only way I really can uh, make a uh, comparison for us and to understand uh, a little bit about where Saul was uh, would be for all of a sudden, if uh, you can imagine how repulsed we would be, how to some extent we are, uh, for example, by uh, the move of, uh, of Islam uh, in our world today. Uh, as, uh, as those who uh, follow uh, Muhammad, Allah, uh, are trying to, to push their religion and uh, as uh, the only true way for those of us uh, who were raised as Christian, we're like, that's, that's you, know, uh, that, you know, imagine, if you will, if someone was to walk into the pulpit next Sunday and begin to talk about um, Allah. You can imagine uh, the reaction here, uh, how well that would uh, go over. Well, to Saul, Christianity was a lot that way. Uh, for all uh, of his life and before that, uh, his grandparents, great-grandparents, for, uh, for years now had uh, talked about uh, Judaism had practiced the sacrificial system and uh, the temples and the priests and uh, now all of a sudden you got a group of people going around saying we don't need a temple anymore, we don't need the priest anymore, we don't need sacrifices anymore. Christ uh, was the one and only sacrifice. To him that was repugnant. That was uh, an absolute offense of the highest level. Again, uh, the nearest thing I can come up with uh, for a comparison would be uh, for us to be confronted uh, with, with Islam or, or Buddhism or something like that as, uh, as a replacement. And, uh, and so Saul sets out uh, doing what uh, perhaps uh, some even today might would try to do. He decides, I'll go arrest them. I'll round them up and persecute them. I'll, I'll beat it out of them. You know, uh, that's, you know, that, that's, what, uh, that's his solution for Christianity. I'll beat it out of them. I'll, uh, I'll beat them into their senses. I'll, uh, you know, you ever, uh, you ever looked at your kid and told them to quit crying or I'm going to smack you? Uh, you know, uh, that's kind of you know, the logic what Saul was using here. I'll beat that Christianity out of them. And so um, he sets off one day uh, on another one of his trips to go round up uh, Christians. And again, Acts chapter 9 tells us that he was literally breathing out slaughtering, breathing 
Uh, that, that just, I think, gives us an image of, uh, of the level of, of, of hatred he had uh, for this new movement of, of Christianity. Uh, and on his way, uh, as he heads down the road with a bunch of his friends, God calls him out. Uh, and uh, that uh, line that many of us know, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And so we've been looking at, at these names that are used twice. Um, I, I have tried over, uh, over the weeks uh, to think about it, uh, kind of what tone uh, would God say it in? How, would God, how did God say uh, their name? When he called Moses, how did he say Moses, Moses? When he called Abraham, uh, and uh, as he called these out, and, and for, for many years, had you asked me, uh, how did God call out Saul on the road to Damascus? I would have told you that he boomed it out angrily. Saul! You know, uh, you know that, that he would have, you know, he would have done, you know, one of those booming, deep voices, tried to scare him out of his shoes, kind of uh, uh, call. But as I thought about it, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, knowing God and and, and God's love and, and God's compassion, uh, I, I've I've kind of come to reconsider that and, and and think that perhaps God, as Saul was traveling, just uh, it was more of a a, a disappointed call, more of a uh, Saul, Saul, what, what are you doing, Saul? Well, what's wrong with you, boy? You know, uh, you know that that kind of. Have you ever had that happen? Maybe maybe one of your children. Uh, you know, they they weren't. Um, weren't doing just what you thought they ought to do and the way you ought to, uh, the way you, you think they ought to do it. And, 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 and you know, I, I can hear Pansy now going, Penny, what's wrong with you, girl? You know, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, mindset, that, you know, that, that kind of thought. I, you know, I've heard Archie do it. James, what is wrong with you, boy? You know, uh, that, that kind of, you know, that mindset. And, uh, you know, that, that's just kind of, you know, that, that's kind of the, the thought I, I think that uh, God was just kind of like, hey, what, what, what's wrong with you, man? You know, I, 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 what's wrong? I, you know, what, what are you doing down there? And, and, and as we look at that, um, I want us to look at this passage and, and think about this question or, or, or this topic uh, as we think about Saul, Saul, when God calls. How do we respond when God calls? How does God call? Uh, what, what does it sound like? What does it look like uh, when God calls? I, I believe that God calls each one of us. I, I believe everyone sitting here this morning, God has a call for you. He may not be calling you into the ministry. He may not be calling you to be a missionary in, in, in Swaziland or something. Uh, he may be calling you to go next door and, and, and deliver a pie to your neighbor. He may be calling you uh, to go next door and, and, and help your neighbor mow the yard. He may be calling you uh, to go next door and witness to your neighbor. Uh, he may be calling you to walk down the street and stop in front of the houses without bothering a soul and pray for the people in those houses. He may be calling you to, to teach a Sunday school class. He may be calling you uh, to, to give, you know, he, he, but he's calling. I, I believe that. I believe uh, that God has a call uh, for every one of us. I, uh, I, being a sports fan, I, I heard this story uh, probably, it's probably, I guess, maybe 30 years ago now, the, uh, the NFL. Uh, the football players uh, went on strike. Some of you, uh, you may remember that. And rather than call off football, they brought in replacement players. And um, I heard that uh, they were, you know, they had to give them a physical before they would uh, let them play. And the physical consisted of taking them in and, and, and having them blow on a mirror. And if they could fog up the mirror, they passed. Uh, you know that that was uh, that that was uh, that was the physical to be a replacement football player, and um, you know I, I believe that's the physical to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to be to be breathing. That's simple. I've watched people, I've seen people laying on their deathbed who God used to touch, uh, to reach out to nurses and medical staff. I, I, I've watched people who were uh, who were bedridden, who were bedfast, uh, who, who God has used uh, to reach out to nursing home retirement center staff. I, I, I've seen people who were uh, who, who were shut in, who God has used to uh, through cards and phone calls and those kind of things to reach out. You you, you may not be able to get out and, and and run the streets and do the things that you once did, knock on doors, uh, but I believe that if you can pass the NFL replacement physical, if you can fog up a mirror, God may have changed your call, 
but he's still calling. So this morning, I want us to look at this passage, and, and, and I want you to, to be sitting here, and, and I want you to think about this question. Over the last few weeks, we've looked at Abraham, we've looked at Moses, we've looked at Martha, we've looked at Simon. Uh, we've looked at these men and women that God has called and, and called them out to a task. And I want to ask you to think about this question. When is the last time I heard my name? When is the last time I heard my name. Now, some of you may be like most of us, to be honest, in the wonderful day of caller ID. You know, we, we look at that thing, and, you know, to be, to be honest with you, I don't even look at it. I just don't answer the phone most of the time. There's enough people at my house, I don't have to answer the phone. Somebody will pounce on that thing. But on the rare occasion that I, you know, you look at that thing and decide. How many of you don't even raise your hand? You know you do that. You look at it and decide. Some of you don't have caller ID. You just don't answer it. You do like I do. My latest, my latest favorite thing to do, I'm going to teach you all something bad this morning. If you got caller ID, you know what I'm talking about. You look at it sometime when you know it's a political call or a salesman. You can just tell what it is. I'll grab up the phone, and I'll, I'll, I will race them to the phone for this one. I got it. I'll grab up that phone and in my best deep radio voice, I, WRSTP, you're on the air live. Do you have a question for John? <laughs> Gets real quiet on the other end. And then you hear click. Most of them don't have a question for John. I don't know why John, I don't know why WRSTP, but that's who it is. That's even too many letters for a radio station, but... It works, try it. Some of us try to do God that way when he calls. We try not to answer. God calls. I want you to notice some things this morning about God's call. I want you to notice, first of all, the source of the call. Most important thing is where the call is coming from. You know that. Well, what was the first thing we do? We go in and you, you walk in the house and somebody, your, your wife, your husband's on the phone talking. What's the first thing we do? Our big old nose comes out. The first thing we do is walk in. Who is it? If it was for you, you'd be talking. You know, who is it? You know, or we look at the caller ID. We want to know who it is. Saul wants to know who's on the caller ID. Notice this. The message is directed. When he answers the phone here, he hears this. Saul, Saul. I want you, if you read this entire passage, you'll notice that, that as, as Saul is headed to Damascus, he is not alone. Saul is not by himself. There are a, he has gathered up a, a group of men. There are others going with him to persecute the Christians. And, and, and as he travels along, he goes along and, and he hears this voice, Saul, Saul. In fact, the Bible tells us that a giant light, a great light shone on Saul. Now, I don't know about you. I've tried this. I've seen others try it. Uh, you know, especially if you've got a group of, uh, of young people, if you've got a group of children, uh, you'll say, hey, sit down, nigga. Who, me? You know, you're the only one standing. You know, you, you know everybody else sitting down. Yeah, you, you know, sit down. You know, and, and, and you know, Saul, as he goes along, as he's traveling along, he couldn't look around and go, hey, I believe he's talking to you. You know, uh, you know, I, I, you know no, but the light's on you. You know, no, that was your name, Saul, Saul. There was no question that God was, what was speaking to them. I, I think about, and I, I've shared this with you before, and I, I've noticed every time I share this story, it, it gets less and less. But, uh, you know, my, my, my method of ministry for the last few years is somebody comes to me and says, you know, we, we really need a ministry to, uh, to the homeless. I say, that's a great idea when you want to start it. Huh? That's a great idea. I agree with you. When you want to start it? Well, not me. I just think we need one. Well, you've got evidently he's talking to you. You got the idea. Yeah, but 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 not me. I was thinking somebody else ought to do it. You know, that's kind of the way we operate. Saul couldn't say, but 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 I think you're talking to him. No, Saul. The message is directed. There, there, there's no question about who he's talking to. I, I, I will assure you this. Some of you, do, do you remember, uh, some of you uh, here this morning that, that you're a Christian, do you remember the day you were saved? You might have been sitting in a church full of people. You know, I, I mean, elbow to elbow, you, you were surrounded. You might have been in one of those 
tent meetings where there were hundreds, maybe even thousands there. You might have been in a, uh, in a stadium, in a Billy Graham crusade, but it felt like that you and the preacher were having a one-on-one -on -one conversation, that there was no one else in that building but you. That, that God was talking to you and nobody else was there. Nobody else could hear what was... It was just you and the preacher. You and the Lord were, were the only ones talking. Saul felt that way on the Damascus Road that day. And I want to tell you something this morning. God has a call for you and you won't be able to pawn it off on somebody else. You won't be able to con it off and say, well, I, I, I think it's somebody else because the message is directed. You won't be able to get away from it. I've talked over the years to too many men who were dealing with the call into the ministry that they couldn't say, well, I believe somebody's being called to preach. I, I believe somebody uh, 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 ought to preach. They came and said, I believe God is calling me to preach. I've had people come to me and say, I believe God is calling me to teach a Sunday school. I believe God wants me to work with this. I believe God, listen, I, I will promise you this, God will get your attention. The message is directed. Not only is the message directed, but notice this. The origin is divine. I love this. Let me, let me back up real quick. Notice what happens here. Uh, if you back up, the light comes on, and, and, and he hears this voice, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, again, one of the most important questions we have when the phone rings is what? We either look at the caller ID, or, 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 or when we answer the phone, if we don't recognize the voice, shortly into the conversation, we'll go, who is this? Who is this? You know, who, who am I talking to? Notice what happens. God does not identify himself. He doesn't say, Saul, Saul, this is God. What are you doing down there, boy? But immediately, Saul knew where the call came from. See that? Verse 5. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? 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 Immediately. I want to tell you something. You will not be able to argue. You'll know it wasn't a burrito I had for supper last night. It wasn't that that, that that song just got up under my skin. It wasn't just that the preacher manipulated me. It wasn't that the teacher had a good message and had it all figured out. I, you will know beyond any shadow of a doubt that God is calling you and, and, and God is dealing with your heart and that he has a, a, a spot for you and, and, and something for you. Again, it may not, again, I'm not saying necessarily that, that, that I'm, I'm not saying you're going to be called to the mission field on the backside of nowhere. You may, listen, the mission field's all around us. There, there's very few of you that, that you can step out your front door and walk to the mission field. We, we are surrounded. I, I was uh, looking at the demographics of, of a five-mile radius of this church uh, just this week. If you've got a mission field, it's within five miles of this church. If you've got a language, there's somebody within five miles of this church can speak it, everything but English. Yeah, we, we're surrounded. It's everywhere. They're, they're coming right here. You don't have to go overseas. Most of us just have to go to a family reunion to find a mission field, to be quite honest with you. Most of us got enough lost loved ones to stay busy till Jesus comes. He knew where the message came from. The origin is divine. But then I want you to notice the third thing about the source of the call. The information is defined. Look what he says to him. Arise and go to the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I love that little word. It will be told to you what you must do. Not what you ought to do, what, not what you could do, but what you must do. You know the difference in must do and could do, right? I, it, it'll be shown to you what you must do. I, I, I want you to notice that, that, that this is not a great statement. You go back and you can... Get your lexicon and look it up in the Greek. There's, it's not a deep theological statement, but there's a lot of meat there. I, I, I told the early service this morning, I believe this with all my heart. If you back up, the Bible again tells us that, that, that when, when the light shone and, and God called him, that he fell to his knees. I believe with all my heart that Saul was so tore up that if God would have told him, go to the city, he'd have crawled. 
That's why I told him, first of all, arise and go to the city. I believe he had crawled. I believe he was that shook up by the call. Arise and go into the city. He, tell, he doesn't just tell him arise and go. No telling where he would have went. But he told him arise and go into the city. And it will be told to you what you must do. Look at that. What a, a directed plan. I think about over the years, and just to use this as an example, uh, uh, of men who have came to me and, 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 and they would come in and, and, and I've noticed kind of a trend. They, they generally come in with really, really wide, broad statements. They, they'll come in and sit down and say, you know, I, don't, I, I just feel like God's, God's wanting me to, to do something. What? I don't know. Keep looking. Keep looking. They'll come back a week or two, month or two, never. But they'll come back and it'll be from way out here. I, I believe God wants me to do something to, I, I believe God wants me to do some kind of ministry. Well, good. What kind? Youth ministry, music ministry, preaching, missionary, home missionary, foreign missionary. Well, I don't know. Keep looking. And they'll come back and they'll have it narrowed down a little bit more and a little bit more, a little bit more. And just to use this for an example, they'll eventually, usually, where they started out here saying, I believe God wants me to do something, it'll end up coming right down to a point. They'll come back and say, I believe God wants me to preach. And I'll look at them and, 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 and th this is my response to them. Don't do it. And they look at me kind of weird. Go ask your brother if I didn't tell him that exact word. Don't do it. Don't do it. If you don't have to, don't. And they'll look at me funny and they'll leave. And usually within a matter of a week or two, they'll come back and say, I got to. I don't have any choice. Where they started out way out here saying, I know God wants me to do something. Eventually, God will make it crystal clear. This is what I want you to do. This is what I want from you. I'm not saying necessarily he's calling you to the ministry. Again, he may be sending you next door to speak nice to that neighbor that you can't stand. He may be sending you next door to witness. He may be sending you next door to invite somebody to church. He may be telling you to talk to somebody at work. I don't know. I'm talking in general about the call of God. You won't have to wander around in the dark wondering what God wants. You'll know He's talking to you. You'll know it's Him talking to you. And if you listen long enough, you'll know what He's saying. Problem is, most of us won't answer the phone. We'll know the source of the call. Now, I want you to notice the other side of this is important. Not just who's calling, but who are they calling? What do we do when somebody calls the phone? We answer, well, who you want to talk to? You know, who, who you want to talk to? Especially if we're a daddy with a teenage daughter, and it sounds like a teenage boy. Just who do you want to talk to? You know, just, just, just who do you think you call it? You know, it's past 5 o'clock in the afternoon. It's too late to be calling my little girl. You know. Not only do we want to know that it's important to know who's calling, it's important to know who they're calling and to understand something about the subject of the call. Now, notice with me, if you will, he's an unlikely candidate. I will assure you that if by any, if by some remote chance, some 2,000 years ago, God would have said, Kevin, I got a job for you. I'm really busy. I got planets to spin and stars to make twinkle and all that kind of stuff. I need you to do something for me. I need you to go to earth and I need you to find somebody to be the leader of the New Testament church. I need you to find somebody to write two-thirds of the New Testament. Handle it. You interview them. You, you check them out, you check the references, you go find that person. I promise you, it wouldn't have been Saul of Tarsus. 
he wouldn't have even got an interview. Listen, I've been in management. I've had people walk in and tell me they want to apply for a job. I've looked them up and down and said, we ain't hiring. You know, usually they walk in, I take an application because you never know. You might need a, you know, it doesn't hurt to have a few. Zelda got a company. She knows what we're not hiring. Don't, you don't even get an application. You know, you don't even get one. You know, you can't, you can't even have one. Saul wouldn't even got an application. He wouldn't even got in the interview room. He, he, he wouldn't, you call his references and said, listen, we're talking about making Saul the head of Christianity. Who? You're kidding. You and I are him. We would have never picked Saul. He is, in all likelihood, the most unlikely candidate ever. Listen, look at that description of him. Breathing out threatenings. That's how bad he hated the church. That's how bad he hated Christianity. That he's described as literally breathing threatenings. How bad, how bad have you got to hate somebody to breathe threatenings? You know, we use that phrase sometimes talking about somebody, oh, he eats and sleeps sports. He, he eats and sleeps hunting. You, you ever heard somebody say something like, he eats and sleeps fishing, those kind of things. He breathes hatred for the church. Let's put him in charge. Sounds like politics. Yeah, let's take the least qualified, put them in charge. Breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of Christ. You keep reading, verse 2 says he goes to the high priest and says, hey, can I go round them up? The high priest says, sure. And on the way, he gets called by the very God of the people he hates. Can I tell you something we learned from Saul? You don't necessarily have to be qualified to be called of God. I don't know if I like it or resemble it, but Junior Hill, I've told you this before, Junior Hill's always said, Evangelist, he says, God calls the ugliest and the dumbest to preach. That way, if they succeed, they know they didn't do it on their looks or their brains. I'm the exception to the rule. Yeah. <laughs> you've heard, there's an old saying you've heard before, God doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the called. I think of a story, some of you may remember this. It's been several years ago. I showed the video of, uh, 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 of a couple of missionaries. They were older when they started feeling the call to the mission field. And I don't remember specifically the village, the country, where they, it really wasn't even a country, it was more of a village that they wanted to go to. <coughs> None of the major mission boards uh, would appoint them because of their age, because they, uh, they felt like by the time they learned the language and were able to communicate with them and everything, that they would be too old uh, to be able to, to survive on the field, too old to do the job. But these, this couple uh, just felt strongly, this is what God wants us to do. And so they began to study, began to prepare, began to learn the language, began to work, and wouldn't give up. And eventually they ended up being appointed to that, uh, somebody did send them to that village. They finally got there, and they ended up leading that entire village to Christ. That village spread out and led a couple more villages to Christ, all because this couple wasn't qualified. Well, I can't go next door and talk to my neighbor. I don't know what to say. Try this. Hey, I'm your neighbor. How you doing? Hey, I saw you moved in. Good to have you. Try that. Don't worry about explaining to him the book of Revelation. If God wants you to explain the book of Revelation to him, God will explain the book of Revelation to you. And then you explain it to them. He was an unlikely candidate. I'm looking around as an unlikely candidate, looking at unlikely candidates. But that doesn't mean God can't use each one of us. He's put you where you are, made you who you are, gave you the talents, the skills, the job, the family, the neighbors that you have for a reason. You live where you do instead of me 
or Pansy or June or Hertha because God wants you there. You work where you do because God has a purpose for you there. God gave you those kin people because he knows if he'd have gave you mine, it'd have drove you nuts. God knows what he's doing. He uses unlikely candidates. If God could use Saul as the, as the leader of the church, the author of two-thirds of the New Testament, he can use you where he wants to. He was an unlikely candidate. Not only is he an unlikely candidate, but he's also in an unusual place. He wasn't in the seminary. He wasn't at Bible college. He was in the middle of nowhere. Go back in your Bible and look at the maps. Between there and, and here is nowhere. And that's where he was. He was an unlikely candidate in an unusual place. We think, oh, God's got all those young men up at Southeastern. He's got all those young men at Southern, Southwestern, Gordon Conwell. God's got all these young fellas, these young men, young women in Bible college. That's who he wants to use. Yeah, he does. You're right. He's got a job for them. He's got a job for you. So you go into places that I can't go. You know people. Nobody else in this room knows. He was an unlikely candidate in an unusual place. But not in an unusual place, but he was in an untimely area. Look what the Bible says about him. And the men that journeyed with him stood speechless. Their leader, let's, let's think about this, just a few hours before, Saul had went to the high priest and said, Hey, can I go to Damascus and round up some Christians? Sure. Can I have some help? Sure. You guys go with Saul. Y'all going to round up some Christians. Off down the road they go. And they get about halfway there, and all of a sudden, the God that they're after appears and says, hey, Saul, Saul, you want to be talking about, you want to talk about being called out in, in, in an untimely spot. You know, if I'm Saul, I'm thinking, Lord, you could have done this when, 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 when I was in the bathroom or something. You could have done this when I was in the bed. You, you, you could have done this when I was in the library. You didn't have to do this out here in front of everybody. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but now let's get out of Saul's shoes for a minute. Now I, I, I'm one of those men that are with him. I'm thinking, hey, we're going to round up followers of Christ. Got one. <laughs> yeah, that was easy enough. Got one. We're going to persecute Christians. <laughs> Got one. You know, Saul, here Saul is. Again, there's no denying you know, the light's shining on him. He's calling his name. He can't stand there and go, I don't know what he's talking about. You know, me? No. Saul is put on the spot in front of his friends. God doesn't always operate on our time schedule either. God doesn't always call when it's convenient for us. Look at Moses. We talked about Moses a few weeks ago. We talked about Abraham. Abraham, you've waited on a son for so long. Now, go kill him. <laughs> and go tell your wife that story. Moses, remember those Egyptians that wanted to kill you? Go back and tell them God sent you to get the rest of the Israelites and lead them out. <laughs> Try that one. An untimely area. See, some of us are sitting thinking, I, I hear people every now and then say something along the lines of when I get ready to retire, I'll do this. I'm working on saving up enough money. If you'd have known me 30 years ago, you knew I had it all figured out. <laughs> 
I had a plan. We ran what we called summer routes out of Florence Bakery. They worked the Myrtle Beach area. They worked from Memorial Day to Labor Day, and then they was off from Labor Day to Memorial Day. I thought that sounded like a splendid idea. I was going to work from Memorial Day to Labor Day and fish from Labor Day to Memorial Day. I thought that was a grand idea. And boys, a lot of those guys made more in those few months of working than most people made in a year. They worked all day and night from Memorial Day and Labor Day, but they had it made from Labor Day to Memorial Day. I thought that sounded like a grand idea. Go down, down there, you didn't even have to put it out. Just pull up the truck, and them crazy vacationers would come, just pounce on it. Sounds like a great idea. I like the general manager in Florence. I thought this would work. That's a great plan. How many of you had plans for your life that are not what they turned out to be? I'm kidding. I, I did think about that, but I knew I'd have to go by myself because Rhonda wouldn't move to the beach. But anyway, wasn't Saul's plan. wasn't Saul's place. It was God's call and God's place. I come back to where we started. When's the last time you heard God call your name? But an even more important question is when is the last time did you answer? That's the most important question. Is when is the last time you answered? When is the last time you did what he told you to do? I want to ask you to bow your heads as our musicians come this morning. This morning, there's some of you sitting here, and God's calling you. He wants you to work in this church. He wants you to go next door and witness to your neighbor. Don't know what the job is. Don't know what the task is, but you know. Maybe he wants you to work with the children at the preschool, the youth, teaching adult class, singing the choir. Just go be nice to your neighbor. That may be the hardest one of all. Just go next door and be nice eventually leading to an opportunity to invite them to church or to tell them about Jesus. Maybe God has shown you very specifically this morning somebody, maybe an employee, maybe a family member, maybe a friend, maybe a neighbor that he wants you to share the gospel with. Most importantly, you're sitting here this morning, and God's been calling you. God's been speaking to you. God's been dealing with your heart, telling you that you need to accept Christ, that you need to become a follower of Jesus, not just a church member, not just a church attender, but a believer. This morning, just as sure as Saul sitting there on that road with a light shining round about him, and God calling his name, you know God's dealing with you and speaking to your heart. You need to come this morning and be saved. Let us show you how you can know him as your personal Savior. God's calling. Will you answer as we stand together?